All right. This is a tutorial on nomenclature. Um, if you need help with forming chemical formulas, look at my previous video on forming of the chemical formulas for the ionic compounds. Nomenclature is just simply naming compounds. It's the convention that we use to decide what we're going to call things. It's divided into roughly two basic categories, organic compounds, which are primarily complex compounds containing carbon, and inorganic compounds, which is pretty much everything else. We're going to focus on the inorganic nomenclature. Mainly we're going to focus on simple ionic compounds, we're going to focus on acids, and we're going to focus on binary molecular compounds. Now to form an ionic compound, we're going to have a cation and an anion. The cations are positive, and if you form that cation from a metal atom, it's just going to take on the name of the metal. For example, the sodium atom, Na, when you form a plus one charge, it's the sodium ion. If a metal can form more than one cation, we're going to have to distinguish which one we're talking about. Some transition metal atoms and some post-transition metal atoms can form more than one possible charge. So we'll have to make clear which one we're talking about. We can do that either by putting the charge as a Roman numeral indicated in parentheses next to the name, or we can add an OUS or IC ending to the end of the name. OUS for the lower charge, IC for the higher charge. For example, Cu with a plus one charge is copper, Roman numeral one, called copper one, or cuprus with the OUS ending. Or copper with a plus two charge can be copper two or cuprig. The us and the ick are the older system, the Roman numeral one and two are the newer system. Now cations form from nonmetals, that is your polyatomic cations end in IUM. The main example of that is the ammonium ion, NH4 with a positive one charge. That's the only common cation that we'll consider in the formation of an ionic compound. Here are some examples of some transition metal and post-transition metal atoms that form more than one possible charge. You see the cuprous and cupric, or copper one and copper two, that we've already mentioned. Now for iron, iron can form plus two or plus three, so it could be iron two or iron three, or ferrous or ferric. Notice we went back to the Latin stem for the name. Now for tin, it can be a plus two or a plus four. So it can be tin two or stannous, tin four or stannic. Lead can also be plus two or plus four. So we can have lead two or plumbus, lead four or plumbic. Note in each of those cases, we went back to the Latin stem for the element that corresponds to the elemental symbol that does not line up with the English name for the element. Now for anions, your monoatomic anions, that is containing only one atom, get the IDE ending. For example, chlorine would become chloride. So I changed that INE ending to IDE. Similar things, oxygen and oxide, nitrogen and nitride, fluorine and fluoride. You can do it with just about any element that will form an anion. There are some exceptions. Hydroxide, cyanide, peroxide are all polyatomic but do end in IDE. So it's important to make note of that. Now, many of your polyatomic anions end in ATE or ITE. The one with more oxygens is ATE. The one with fewer oxygens is ITE. For example, NO3 is nitrate. NO2 is nitrite. So note the 8 for 3 oxygens, the 8 for 2. 
Now, the 8 and the 8 don't correspond to a particular number of auctions. It's just the one with more is 8, the one with fewer is 8. They have the same charge, if you know, negative 1 charge on each, but there's a difference of 1 and only 1 oxygen in between the two. Now, sometimes you have more than 2 in the series, so 8 and 8 won't quite cut it. You're going to need to distinguish between more than two members of a series. So if you have four members in the series, you've still got your eight and your eight, but if you've got one more oxygen than the eight, you're going to add a per prefix, but keep the eight ending. If you go one fewer than the eight, you're going to have a hypo prefix and an ite ending. Now, not all things have all four members of the series. You may have a per or something, but not a hypo, or you might just have the eight and the eight. Many organic ions will end in eight, but there won't be any other members of the series. So it just depends on which series you're talking about. Here are series for chlorine, bromine, and iodine. You see the monoatomics. You see Cl minus for chloride, like we mentioned before. Br minus is bromide. I minus is iodide. Now, if I look at the chlorine series, the bromide and the iodide series are the same. If I stick an oxygen in there, we call that hypochlorite. Two oxygens is chlorite, no prefix. One more would be chlorate, note the A-T-E ending. And then four oxygens is going to be perchlorate. The bromine and iodine series are very similar. But notice here, the 8 ion is what they call a common or representative anion. And you can form the others by adjusting the number of oxygens up or down. So if you memorize the 8s, the others are easily determined. Now, some anions you can add additional hydrogens to while still having a negative charge. So we call those anions containing hydrogen. If you add one hydrogen, you can get a bi prefix on certain anions, or use the word hydrogen. For two, it would be dihydrogen, three would be trihydrogen, so on and so forth. For carbonate, CO3 negative two, we can add one hydrogen. We reduce the charge by one because hydrogens are positive. We can call that bicarbonate or hydrogen carbonate. Now, for phosphate, phosphate has a negative 3 charge. We add one hydrogen, we reduce the charge to negative 2, and we call that hydrogen phosphate. It's not technically considered appropriate to call, call something biphosphate. Something that's negative 2, like carbonate or sulfate, it's appropriate, but not negative 3, like phosphate. If you add two hydrogens, you get a negative 1 charge, and it's dihydrogen phosphate, indicating the two hydrogens. This is a list of common anions. You see some monoatomics and some polyatomics. You see that the list of anions is much larger than the list of cations. And so you'll want to refer with your teacher to determine which ions you're required to memorize. But this is a reasonable list and it is certainly not all inclusive. But we will use this list to motivate the rest of our discussion about nomenclature. So let's try to name or give formulas for the following ionic compounds. So let's take a look at calcium chloride. What we find is that calcium chloride is going to consist of two ions. We've got a calcium plus 2 and a chloride minus 1. Referring back to our chemical formulas discussion on the previous video, you want to form this formula that has the smallest set of whole numbers that creates an electrically neutral unit. The chlorine is negative 1, so it's going to go into 2 twice, so I'm going to have 2 chlorides and 1 calcium. So our formula would be CaCl2, so we formed the correct formula. Now for aluminum nitrate, what we find 
is that I've got an aluminum with a plus three charge and a nitrate with a negative one charge. Again, one goes into three, three times. So I'm going to need three of those nitrates. And note, I put parentheses around it and put a three on the outside, indicating there are three of that entire unit. So AL, and then in parentheses, NO3, and then outside the parentheses, we got a three. Now for CuClO42, we're, we're going to have to look at that copper, and we're going to have to look at that perchlorate, and decide what the charge on that copper is going to be if we're going to appropriately name it. So we can find that since we get two negative one perchlorates, that the copper has to be plus two for it to equal out in terms of charge. Based on that, we we know we got a copper, we know we got a perchlorate, so we can call it copper two perchlorate using the Roman numeraling method, or we can say cupric perchlorate using the older method. Now for the NH4 to SO4, we just have two polyatomic ions. So really all we need to do is to name the polyatomic ions, cation first, anion second, and then we're essentially done. But we can see we got one plus one ammonium, one minus two sulfate. So the formula is correct, and we're just going to name it ammonium sulfate. We're just going to name the two ions. Now for acids, the acids are named differently. They're similar to ionic compounds in that the formulas are formed the same way, but the name is different so that you know it's an acid. And it's derived from the name of the anion. If the anion ends in "-ied", you're going to get a hydro prefix and an IC ending on your acid. If it ends in "-ate", you're going to get an IC ending, but no prefix. If it's "-ite", on the anion, you're going to get an OUS ending on the acid. And again, the formulas are formed the exact same way as you do for an ionic compound, so you can look back at the chemical formulas video if you're unsure about that. But in an acid, H plus is always the cation. So in this example, we'll name or give the formulas for the following acids. So in this case, we have sulfuric acid, and we want to be able to give its formula. So we're basing it on an IC ending acid, which means it's going to be an ATE ending polyatomic ion, so that's going to be the sulfate ion. So we've got an H plus, the cation, for an acid, and we've got sulfate 2 minus as being the anion. So forming the correct formula, one goes into two, two times. So there's going to be two hydrogens, one sulfate. So our correct formula is H2SO4. The next one is nitrous acid. We get an OUS ending acid, which means it's going to be an ITE ending polyatomic ion with the hydrogen ion as the cation. So we've got H plus and NO2 with a negative one charge because nitrous acid is going to be from the nitrite anion. The charges are the same, so one of each. And so our correct formula is going to be HNO2. Moving on to HBr, we want to name that. So we've got a hydrogen and a bromide. Now, if it ends in IDE, that means it's going to get a hydro prefix and an IC ending. So our name is hydrobromic acid. We we use the stem of the bromine, but change the ending to IC, add the hydro prefix and the word acid. The last one there is HClO4, and we've got a polyatomic ion, perchlorate, 
with the hydrogen cation. So since it's an AT ending ion, it's going to be an IC ending acid. And since it's perchlorate, we're going to carry that per prefix over. So we have perchloric, so prefix and IC ending, and then the word acid. So that's how you name acids. Now for binary molecular compounds, we have two elements, both of which are nonmetals, or there's an occasional metalloid thrown in like silicon. The one that's most metallic, quote unquote, which is I the farthest left on the periodic table, or the farthest down a column is typically written first, with a few exceptions. NH3 is ammonia, or there are certain ones with a halogen in combination with an oxygen that don't follow that rule, but in general that is certainly the case. Now what we do is we use Greek prefixes to indicate the number of each type of atom. The first element is named, and then the second element, the ending gets changed to IDE. The prefix mono is never going to precede the first element. If if it's just one of the first element, we just drop the mono and don't use a prefix at all. And particularly in front of oxide, we're going to drop that O or A at the ending of the prefix to help pronunciation a little bit. The prefixes for the Greek prefixes are here. Don't use the Latin ones. Mono is one, di is two, Tri is 3, tetra is 4, penta is 5, hexa is 6, hepta is 7, octa is 8, nana is 9, and deca is 10. If you want time to copy those down, you can just pause the video and copy them. So let's either name or give formulas for these binary molecular compounds. We've got a nitrogen trifluoride. So there's a tri in front of that fluoride. There's no prefix in front of the nitrogen implying one. So there we omitted the mono. So it's going to be one nitrogen and three fluorine atoms. And we see that's in fact what we get. We get NF3. Now if we got dichlorine monoxide. So we got two chlorines, one oxygen. Notice I dropped the O on the end of the mono. And so we got Cl2O. Moving on to the next one, we got N2O4. So now we got the formula. We got two nitrogens, four oxygens. So I'm going to use the prefix di that goes with two and the prefix tetra that goes with four. So we get dinitrogen tetroxide. Again, dropping the A on the tetra. Notice all the endings. The second element's in an IDE. The last one, P4S10, I've got four phosphorses, 10 sulfur, so the prefix for four is tetra, prefix for 10 is deca. So we got tetraphosphorus, deca sulfide. Now you do get some binary hydrogen compounds which have the same formulas as the corresponding hydro prefix acid, but they're not dissolved in water. Most of those compounds are gases outside of water. In these cases, we're going to name them a little differently, and they're, by convention, we're not going to use any prefixes. These compounds would normally be an acid, but they're not in water. For example, so I got HCl in the gas phase, we call it hydrogen chloride. We'll just name the hydrogen and change the ending. HCl aqueous with the AQ is going to be hydrochloric acid, like we na would have named in the acid section. But by convention, no prefixes or anything is used on these. This ends my tutorial for the nomenclature of inorganic compounds.